So I am Bill Turner, and I'll tell you a little bit about myself, and then you can introduce yourself after I uh, show a particular slide. And I started with this slide. Someone said, oh, it's beautiful. And the answer is, um, I've received various blessings in my life, and one of them is I now get to teach a four-day course in the Tetons for these <laughs> folks on moisture management and historic structures and new assemblies. And I get to do that because I stuck my nose in a project four years ago as a volunteer and said, I think there's a better way to do this. And they said, you're right, come and teach for us. So, so I, volunteering has been a wonderful treat in my life. I, I got my first job because I volunteered to measure carbon monoxide in hockey rinks in Boston back in the 70s when we had Zambonis running around without... Um, catalytic converters on them and the kids were in below the boards and the ice and they shut the ventilation off because of the energy crunch and and we were saying like these kids are being exposed like they were smokers when it comes to carbon monoxide so wow. and then so I got stolen at that point by Harvard and got to work on a health study for 10 years um, so so that's the background. My intent after talking with Norm was to try to weave together climate change, energy use, and indoor air quality and explain to you how I think they're all related. So I called 150 slides down to something less. Lots of them are photos. And, and feel free to ask questions as we go. So I actually set up some lear learning objectives. But I want you to know, you know I, your son, you said, is an engineer in training. I was an engineer in training, but I learned best by doing because I grew up on a Sunoco gas station. And from age 12 on, I was fixing cards. And, and, but I started out cleaning toilets you know, um, <laughs> on Saturdays. Um, and, and my history in engineering is fascinating because back before Cambodia was invaded, I was like on academic probation. And I sort of had a choice when I graduated go do nuclear power or go build weapons for Vietnam. And so the fascinating thing for me was I saw this sign at M that MIT posted on a clean, non-polluting car competition, put together a design team and enter it. So I went into my academic advisor, who I knew quite well at that point, because they were like, if you don't change, you're getting kicked out of here. And I said, can we do this? And he said, yeah, you're the leader. <laughs> And I put together a team, and for the next, the rest of my career at Northeastern, I was on Dean's List. Because all of a sudden, I had something that I could apply engineering to that, that was real to me. So, <laughs> of course, I, I blew my parents away because I quit school the next year for a year and worked as a, a youth worker for high school kids for the Lutheran Church doing planning process. What do you got for a youth group? What do you want to have? How are you going to get there kind of thing. Then I went back to engineering school, and it was great to actually see projects I could do, do measurable results on, because when you're working with high school kids, you're not always measuring the results. So that's my background. So what I figured I'd do with you this, this lunchtime is share my personal experience, which is actually measuring climate change, um, a summary of building science fundamentals, which you all need to understand if you're going to save energy in buildings. I'll talk about indoor air quality and what we know about that. And I'll talk about the real, some real simple guidelines for new construction and adaptive reuse that could be adapted. Because Maine currently has an antique energy code. Maine goes by the 2009 energy code, uh, which is a complete antique. It lets you do things that are not real smart for a building that's going to be in existence for the next 50 years. And there's some easy ways to improve that. Uh, all of the rest of New England has adopted the 2012 code or 2015 code or the 2018 code as people have moved forward for energy efficiency, but not the state of Maine, which is very sad to be a resident of a state that doesn't have, in my opinion, the best energy and environmental leadership at the moment. This is the engineer's map of the United States that tells you this is climate zone seven, where it gets real, real cold. And this is climate zone six, where it's often cold. And this is climate zone five, where it's sometimes cold. Engineers have to design a building to meet a certain climate zone. So it matters what's your expectation of your ownership in your building as to how it should be designed. 
and, and what criteria are you going to design it to? Now that said, there's a lot of folks right now criticizing ASHRAE for your map is the historic 15-year climate zones. We have no clue what the next five-year climate data looks like for any part of this country. We can guess. It's back to what do they say about stocks? Past history is no predictor of future performance or something. And there's some real concerns about what our climate is or isn't doing that you folks probably understand better than I. So, um, so let's, let's talk about climate change at the moment in my own personal experiences with any of it. The data clearly shows that most glacial ice is melting. Doesn't come to it as a surprise to me because I've stood on a bunch of glaciers for the past 40 years. That's my historic mountaineering buddy and that's he and I on Denali in 85. And if I'm gonna go climb Denali, I'm also gonna take a carbon monoxide meter with me. And we published the paper in, in Alaska Medicine on how to not die in a snow cave or tent. Because the minute you put a pot of snow on top of a camp stove to make water, you just created the best carbon monoxide generator you could because that snow is quenching the flame. It's the same issue car engines face of you need the engine running hot enough to not produce CO, but it has to be cool enough to not melt the pistons. Um, so, so that was my initial experience. The bad news is this guy and I tend to do a, a trip each year on the Continental Divide with an ex-Denali Ranger and an ex-Yellowstone uh, Ranger. And on the map, you look at, well, should I bring some crampons because I might be crossing a glacier and you get to the glacier and it ain't there anymore. You're in mud. You might have a snowfield left, but the continental glaciers in the United States are drastically melting and changing. So let's talk about carbon dioxide, probably one of the significant actors in all that. Why do I know anything about measuring carbon dioxide? Well, for 40 years, we've always had to measure the outside concentration of carbon dioxide to compare it to the inside concentration in the building because it's a surrogate for how much you're diluting the breathing air that you're emitting into the building. So I actually brought a carbon dioxide monitor with me. It's now reading 983, which tells me if you really want to be healthy in this room, by the time we're done, you open a window and let more fresh air in, because the standard for indoor buildings is if you go above 1,100 parts per million, you're not providing enough dilution air from outside. Now, the alarming thing to me this morning at 8 o'clock is I, I plug this instrument in outside my office um, to see if it was going to read 400, which is typically what outside is. It read 500 this morning. I went down and got another instrument and plugged it in, and it read 500. Now, I didn't go get the calibration gas and try to calibrate the instrument because I was running short on time. So you never make decisions but with a $129 instrument, which what that is. I went and got a $600 instrument and plugged it in and read the same thing. So I have no clue whether this morning's CO2 outdoor levels were really that high uh, or the instruments need better calibration. Back when I started doing environmental measurements 50 years ago, you had to calibrate the instrument twice a day to get data that was dependable. Typically today's instruments, those are infrared, you calibrate that once a year to where's get your, where's that, Bill? in Harrison, and it's the woods, yeah. and and I'm not running a wood stove these days. So, so if you were near the main turnpike or downtown Portland, so someone said to me, you got to realize the wind direction has changed. Right now, it's from the northeast. That means we're getting air that came from New York and has gone around and is coming back on land again. So there's some fascinating climate stuff going on. So, so that's my experience with CO2. The ice is melting, no question about that. The data we have says we've got the smallest ice pack on the planet at the moment. You say, well, have you been somewhere to measure it? And my answer is no. But the guy I hike with all the time has been to both the Arctic and Antarctic and done work in both places. What we hope is that the that fresh that melted seawater doesn't get underneath the ice cap in the Antarctic or we're going to have lots of problems on the planet because uh, ice floats. 
which is good because it lets our climate work. But if you get melt water underneath a piece of ice, it tends to melt a lot faster. So real interesting things going on. Talk about ocean levels. This is data that, to, in my opinion, is not disputable. The oceans are rising. I actually heard a, there was an excellent woman on NPR last week who said, hey, you know, you don't have to believe in gravity to see the effects. And her comment was, you don't have to be, believe in climate change to see the effects. But clearly, the effects are happening. It's like, duh. Yeah, the oceans have risen a foot in 10 years. That's New York City. I actually got to teach in New Zealand two years ago. You got farmers losing their fields to the ocean that's rising around the planet, never mind people losing their housing throughout the planet. So I don't consider ocean rise in any way disputable. It, it's happening. Yeah, all you got to do is look at the main coast um, or any place else, and it's like, you know, this is going on. So we have got data, we've got great satellite data that says the global temperature is rising. And the answer would be, well, that ain't anything compared to the, the temperatures that are rising in the oceans. Um, and when you warm up water, what happens to it? It expands. So we think at least half of the increase in, in sea rise changes from water expanding in addition to the extra water you're putting into it. And then there's the Gulf of Maine climate data which says, hey, something serious is going on in the Gulf of Maine. And it, it, it's not, on the planet, there's only two other places that look like they're rising faster than the Gulf of Maine. So, so my slides all have references on them wherever I get this stuff, which you folks are welcome to track down if you want. So I'm going to switch gears, because right now, other than some of the committees you all are on, which I find real exciting because I don't know a lot about them yet, um, voting and education is the best thing I know I can do about climate change at the moment. So I'm going to talk about buildings and in their air quality, which is what I've done for 40 years as a profession. So let's focus on buildings. The good and bad news is buildings in the USA use and waste a lot of energy compared to the rest of the planet. Uh, the good news is, so this is commercial and residential buildings and energy use. This is the, the energy flow of the United States, okay? This is industry. Most people think U.S. industry is some of the most efficient industry on the planet in terms of how they use energy. Um, and transportation energy, as long as you don't mess with the transportation standards too much, it's gradually, drastically changing, you know? I have a, a, a baby diesel-powered pickup that I go traveling in that gets 25 miles per gallon all the time, um, which, you know, 10 years ago would have been 12 miles per gallon. I just bought a Clarity plug-in um, to change my footprint. Clarity, a Honda Clarity plug-in will do 40 miles on a battery charge, and then there's an engine that turns on. You can put them both on if you want to play sports car. Um, so transportation sort of taking care of itself if you don't mess with that. You and industries doing a pretty good job of being energy efficient. What's left is, is buildings. And you say, well, why does this matter? Well, you all know why it matters, because those who harvest energy don't particularly have safe or healthy jobs. Whether you're a miner in the Ukraine or a bird that's been soaked with leaked crude oil or God forbid the, the folks who live near Tar Sands Project. Uh, this is not good stuff, what we're going on. Or those tall chimneys on coal-fired power plant is what give us acid rain. Um, we've been dealing with acid rain in New England and New York for the 30 years I've been aware of it. Um, and we know the Osage, oceans are dealing with acidification from both CO2 and the sulfur that we throw into the air. So, so get, to get to a positive note, there's a lot of great stuff we could be doing on buildings. So I'm going to quickly go through what building science is. You have to understand building science if you don't want your building to fall apart from rot. Um, 
We started doing energy conservation in buildings 35 years ago without training the staff that do it adequately, and we ended up with some problems in buildings. So Department of Energy went back and researched all that and actually started training crews to do energy conservation appropriately so you don't make someone sick in a building. So my learning experience in this whole field started in 81. This is what I live in in Harrison. I bought it when my neighbor said, you don't own anything yet, why don't you tackle this thing? So that was a summer only house on the shores of Long Lake in Harrison and um, had never been lived in in the winter time. So I, six months later, owned it and proceeded to learn a lot from it. And the lessons were somewhat painful and I'll go through some of those at the end. Uh, the, the end result is I know a lot about what to and what not to do in buildings this day. So I renovated it because someone told me, don't make it too tight, it has to breathe. Because we aren't perforated, right? We have controlled <laughs> apertures to breathe through. Uh, my house did not have controlled apertures to breathe through after I renovated it. had two 70,000 BTU wood stoves and I rented it to a young lady who was an elementary school teacher who called me up and said, I can't eat this place, I'm freezing, get yourself up here and figure it out. And I'm like, what do you mean I can't rent it? I just spent 20 grand money putting insulation in it, but I didn't make it tight. So I actually hired David Harji and Gautam Dutt, who were at Princeton at the time, developing the first house doctor methods. And we figured out that I had created a leaky sieve of a building, even though I had put five and a half inches of fiberglass on all the walls under my feet. To, 12 inches of fiberglass in the attic. When it got cold, the air just flowed through the building in great quantities and I couldn't heat it. So, so let's do the basics of building science. Building science is real simple. Heat moves from more to less. You can't stop that from happening. You can slow it down with what we call insulation. Uh, you can redirect it maybe with what we call insulation, but you can't stop it from happening. Um, that means in Maine or any other place you heat a building, air would like to get out the top and come in the bottom. Can't stop that from happening other than the wind blowing 30 miles an hour, making it go, the cold air come in one side and go out the other, instead of coming in the bottom and going out the top. Well, in the summertime, the attic gets hot and it still goes out the top, because the minute the sun beats on a roof, that surface temperature is about 140 degrees, which then heats up the attic, which then makes air leave, which is actually what keeps roofs in Maine dry a good part of the year. Um, all of that sucks in radon from the earth. And if radon was valuable, we'd all be retired because <laughs> Maine has like 400 to 4,000 picocuries of radon gas per liter in the soil underneath all our homes. The good news is, if you simply put a small fan in, create a tiny suction underneath your concrete floor, you'll make the air go down and out and take the radon with it as opposed to it coming in for your home. So for most part, for $1,500 or so, you can stop from breathing radon in a house that has a concrete floor. If you could do it yourself, you would, it would, you're paying $200 for a fan that lasts for 30 years and some plastic pipe as opposed to paying a contractor to do it. Maine has all kinds of laws that govern who can do radon if it's a rental property or something you're selling. Um, that's pretty good. So to control a high performance building, you need to control the wind, not let the wind blow through it. You need to control the air leakage so all the heat isn't going out the top. And you need to make sure the air then goes where you want it to go so you don't end up downdrafting a combustion appliance and sucking your wood stove fumes into your living room because you turned on the exhaust fan in the kitchen because you were going to cook. And we'll go through some of those quickly. So here's the rules of moisture. I mean, we just switched from air to moisture. Yeah, I did. Because moisture in this climate becomes real important. Um, Water drains down. That's why we put drains around buildings, except for when it wicks up. How high can it wick up? Anybody? How high is the highest redwood tree? 
So you put a concrete wall of a house in a wet earth, because it rains a lot in Maine, and you don't do something as a capillary break to stop capillary suction, you now have a wet wall in a basement, even though you didn't want that. So builders have to learn and relearn. Anytime you're going to finish a basement, how do you not have damp concrete behind your wall rowing stuff? Because water wicks up concrete. Um, the other thing that's interesting is the sun drives moisture from more to less. So if it rained out the night before and your clapboards got soaked from wind-driven rain and the sun comes out and hits it, it just drove the moisture into the wall. And if you happen to have oriented strand board in there and not a good drainage plane and, and drain plane in between that water and your oriented strand board, it now turns to mush and your, rot, your wall rots away. So we now know above, enough about this to train builders to do it right. And in fact, uh, I'm in the middle of teaching a four-day residential construction series training with the Maine Under Air Quality Council on how to build healthy, new, energy-efficient housing, because we know how to do that these days. Um, I, I have one handout for you. It's, it's one page. If you didn't get one, pick one up later. It tells you how to do 40% better than the antique main energy code. It's free to you to download off of this website I've highlighted at the bottom. And, and the arrows I put on the back tell you what it does better than, which is the 2009 code that Maine has in place. Because the 2009 code is the absolute minimum you could possibly build in a house to think about heating it in the state of Maine. Um, there's all kinds of guidance on how to do a lot better. In simplistic terms, um, it also will tell you how to manage moisture. So the, the rules of moisture look something like this. You've got to drain the water away or you end up with a problem in your basement. And if the wind's blowing, wind-driven rain at your house and there's holes in your house, the water will get past the outside and wet your wall and you need to think about how the wall's going to dry out. And there's all kinds of ways to build that. And this gets even more challenging in the climate of Maine, because this is not Utah, where I own another property. This is 60 plus inches of rain a year, not 10 inches of rain a year. But there's all kinds of guidance, a lot of it from Building Science Corp, on how to do this and build a wall that'll last in any climate. In simplistic terms, drain, drain the water off the building and away from your foundation. Uh, simplest things is kick out flashing where this roof engages this wall, kick the water out away from the building because if it runs down the building, this wall will eventually rot away. But there are people still not doing that. Um, drain the, the water away from your building. If you've got a hill above your building, you need a swale before between the hill and your building. You need to pitch all around your building 5% away, and even for 10 feet on the uphill side, you need to pitch it away. That's a real basic thing that not all your builders are doing. Plus, the, wa the, the, the earth around a building tends to sink in the first year because you didn't compact it real hard. So you actually have to build it higher than the 5% grade. So by the time it sinks down, it still drains away from the building. And what's the lesson in this slide? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we build buildings in, in crazy places that, that maybe you need to do something different if you're going to build it there. This is the Ninth Ward two years after the flood of New Orleans. And, you know, they're now they put parking under these homes. So the next time it floods and the water gets up to here, Everything in your house is still above the water line, and once the water goes back down, you put things back together and go forward. Um, and lots of folks are saying, hey, the flood maps now say <laughs> when it rains a lot. When we get the 100-year flood every 10 years, you need to think about rebuilding differently, or, or you're going to waste a lot of somebody's money. But you don't need infrared thermography or a lot of knowledge to know that that building has air leaks. You would never have that much melting off the roof if there wasn't air leaking into the attic carrying heat with it. So 
in addition to needing to replace the glass because the ice is breaking it, um, somebody before the next year needs to figure out where the air leaks are and fix them. Uh, those buildings are going to continue to attempt to heat the outdoors, which is what's going on. When a building leaks heat, it's attempting to heat the outdoors, which is a, a very productive thing to do. So this is an infrared thermograph taken of the outside of a building. Um, where this X is, it says it's 19 degrees there. So this is a two-story building, and where it's dark, they actually did a great job of insulating it. <laughs> See these wispy, light, bright spots here is where the heat's leaking out of the building. Um, and and this, this is taken, I got a couple of $10,000 cameras, but in the advent of, of stuff, this is... This is now, this is an infrared camera that will plug into your smartphone for 300 bucks. So you don't need a $10,000 camera anymore to figure out where heat's leaking out of a building. Um, this was bought from my Galaxy 4 and it worked great. I had to put an adapter on it to make it work on my Galaxy 8, but it, it still works. So, but now you've gone from something that's prohibitive for someone to own that, hey, if, you've got, if you aren't on fixed income, just barely making it, 300 bucks is a manageable expense to be able to figure out where is this building leaking heat that I can do something about. So pretty amazing. So, so we now have $120 carbon dioxide monitors. We have $300 infrared cameras. We actually have... $300 instantaneous radon monitor. So you can put this in a house and in uh, 24 hours figure out whether the radon's at an acceptable level or not. None of this technology existed five years ago. Um, so the knowledge that's available for having good indoor air quality and comfort is incredible. And you can go to any auto parts store and for 50 bucks buy an infrared thermometer that tells me that wall is at 70 degrees F. Um, so you don't even have to buy an infrared camera if you just want to know the temperature. And this is my last show and tell toy. This is what I teach the course on the Tetons with. This is a $45 um, available from Lowe's or Home Depot moisture meter. And it will tell me if I'm alive <laughs> um, because it, it measures moisture content. And, as long as I'm alive, it'll tell me, hey, you're wet. This is what any painter would have to make sure the wood's dry enough to paint. But this is what you need to figure out if a building needs to be dried out so it doesn't grow mold. Um, and so the advent of equipment is pretty phenomenal compared to what we had 10 years ago. If your attic looks like this, someone sold somebody something that didn't work very well. If you go into your attic and you see something that looks like cotton candy, and they tell you, oh, it's an R35 attic. Well, not really, because if it's cotton candy, the cold sinks down into the insulation and it doesn't work very well. If that's two feet of cellulose, as long as you keep it dry, you don't have a leaky roof, it's a wonderful insulating system. But the, R, the rated R value of this is the same as the rated R value of cellulose but they don't work the same. They don't perform the same when it's, especially when it's 20 below zero. What is that insulating What is it? Yeah. It's fluffy fiberglass. Yeah. It, it could be mineral wool, but it, it's not. Uh, mineral wool actually would pack down better. So it's blown fiberglass? It's, it's blown fiberglass. It's blown old fiberglass. Some of the newest fiberglasses can be blown tight. But this is, when it looks like cotton candy, performs like cotton candy. Cold air just sinks down into it. Um, so the, the rest of this building stuff is you got to plan the air flows in a building. You don't want the kitchen exhaust fan downdrafting the chimney and it coming out the fireplaces. So you tighten the building up and you plan for not having radon come in and not having leaks in the ductwork. And in fact, you don't put the equipment here unless you put the insulation up here. <laughs> we have this terrible habit of putting HVAC equipment in unconditioned attics, which is the worst place you could think about putting them, other than maybe in your garage, um, which they actually do in the Pacific Northwest because the climate's not as brutal. 
So equipment should always be put in the, in the uh, thermal envelope of the building. So let's talk about indoor air quality. Uh, this is what I've been doing since 1975, grad school. I got stolen to work for Harvard. Um, I got to work in the Harvard Six City study. I got to measure tobacco smoke in homes and gas cooking in homes and nitrogen oxide in homes. And after 10 years of doing that, I left to move to Maine to start consulting work. And that data all got used to help understand how do we make healthy housing, including how do we not have tobacco smoke in the house, because I think one of the conclusions was the respiratory disease for children before the age of six doubled if there was a smoker in the home. Norm, you may know other salient facts of, of that research. Uh, when we started out doing the research, we didn't have microwave ovens, so all of a sudden, People who were making tea on a gas flame were not making it by the time we ended up finishing the research. So you took a combustion appliance out of the buildings. There has never been a, a mandatory requirement for kitchen exhaust fans. The 2018 code says you shall put a kitchen exhaust fan over all cooking appliances. Because when, when you burn something really bad, it's not much better than wood or cow dung or tobacco that you burn. It's, it's nasty stuff that's probably carcinogenic. So the, we don't want to live in houses this way. We don't want to live outside this way. My wife's about to embark upon a trip to China, and she's taking a mask with her. Um, pardon? No, 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 not one that's that good. Um, but the good news is, for those of the, you that play with Hobbies, you can now buy an N95 dust mask in Walmart, Home Depot, Napa, etc., for like $4, and it will protect you from most of the tiny particles you would get doing a hobby. And you can buy it with a breathe valve in it, so when you exhale it, it doesn't fill up with moisture inside. And none of that existed to the public 20 years ago, and you can buy it in any hardware store now. So we've come a long way in personal protective equipment for hobbies. There's 1,500 miles of passageways in here. It's why people breathe stuff in when they do drugs. There's, what's, the, what's the space between the air passageway and your blood? Anyone know? It's one <laughs> cell width. So anything you put in your lungs, if it not, it, what's worse, if it gets stuck in there, it's even worse, like asbestos, which behaves like a needle. So it's really important not to have people breathing nasty stuff. So it's important also because we spend 90% of our time indoors. And uh, OSHA, by the way, assumes, hey, yeah, you can be allowed. It's, a, it's, a, it's not an, it's the economic burden of, of work allows you to be exposed for this. The economic burden and health risk allows you to be exposed for this for eight hours. And then we assume you go home and outgas for the rest of the time. Well, if you don't go home and outgas for the rest of the time, your exposure is actually very different. So it's important to have both workspaces and houses not be sources of major pollutant exposure. And so we have this guidance on ventilation. So this is, don't pass out in the ship. You should pump in five cubic feet a minute of fresh air. This is Florence doing some fascinating work in which war? A Crimea war saying soldiers that are in a hospital with operable windows get better faster than if you have the windows closed. This is work in Boston and other places that said the disease transmission rate in schools is lower if we pump air through the school or have operable windows. And what happened here? This is, uh, you can go back to don't pass out in the ship because oil and costs so much compared to what it used to cost. Oil right now is actually, with the cost of inflation, is cheaper than it used to be like 40 years ago. Um, and this is, by the way, when you have nasty stuff in the air, you need to dilute the heck out of it, and it's still not safe. And after the, the, the running mean like out of, out of all of this is still somewhere like around 18 or 15. So most folks today would say you ought to have 15 CFM of outside air in a building to dilute the bioeffluence that we all either exhale or emit from 
from uh, sweating or from bioeffluence in other parts of your body. And as long as you're less than 1,000, 1,100, we're at 1,000. So the, ventil the ventilation in here actually isn't that bad compared to some places I teach. So there's all kinds of guidance on how much do you dilute air in buildings. There's all kinds of inexpensive equipment now for how do you measure that to keep people safe. This is actually in a log building in Bridgeton that we renovated. And the solution there is it's a manually controlled ventilation system. And when you put 40 people in the conference room, you watch this gauge. And as, as it goes past 700, you turn the fan on the low speed and suck some of the bioeffluence of the people out. And as, as it goes past 900, you turn the high speed on and open the windows in the conference room. It's a manually controlled ventilation system with variable apertures. We call those windows. I already alluded to the fact that the codes recommend a minimum of ventilation in a kitchen. And if you've got a nice, efficient flame like this, you also have a carbon monoxide generator when you put a cold pot on it. So it's another reason to, to exhaust cooking. You can't just say, just exhaust gas and not electric, or you get sued because <laughs> of fair trade laws. So, so it's interesting politics of what we have to say about cooking. The bottom line is burnt food isn't good for you either. Neither is carbon monoxide. The worst thing you can do, by the way, is for health-wise, is heat your house with the oven, which is what some people are resort to. But heating the house with your oven means you're putting carbon monoxide in your house. You're also putting extra moisture in, because for every pound of fuel you burn, you get two pounds of moisture which may help your nose, but it's bad in terms of growing mold somewhere. So ventilation can't fix everything. You all know, we all know smoking is terrible. Scented candles are no bargain. Let's put some oil in with the wax and starve it in the jar, and we'll produce all kinds of soot. If you turn on a laser particle counter and light a candle, the laser particle counter takes off like you're behind the exhaust pipe of a car or a truck. You just can't see it very well. Uh, Plug-ins, I had to convince my daughter when she was on her own in her house that oh, I don't like smelling the dogs. Well, turn up the air-to-air -air heat exchanger because plug-ins aren't... Plug-ins make your nose sort of dead so you don't smell other things. Um, plus, then the question is, what else do they put in the air? Now, if you want to convince your now 31-year-old uh, daughter, ask her to Google health effects of something and and maybe she'll listen to you more than she would listen to her dad, but we're, we're doing pretty well. Um, and the last one I put here is summer humidity. You can say, well, summer humidity is a health effect. Well, yeah, sort of. Summer humidity is what drives mold growth in Maine. And we know enough about human health and mold that, that stuff growing in your house isn't probably a good idea. Stuff growing in your garden is part of the natural process of growing a garden. And we, we have to have decomposition of leaves and all of that whole cycle, and it's all natural. But that shouldn't be going on inside your house if you're at all sensitive to mold. So if your clothes look like this, this is not good. If your door looks like this, it, it's not good. Um, how bad is it? Depends on whether you're allergic to what's growing or not. Um, if you aren't allergic to it, maybe you'll develop an allergy to it. So for the most part, there's all kinds of guidance on don't let mold grow in your house. We say, well, why would mold grow in Maine? It's because we get Orlando air in Maine sometimes. We get 75 degree dew point air. It's the same as what they're dealing with in Orlando. They turn on an air conditioner and dry it. We may or may not have a dehumidifier or air conditioner to dry it. Um, and so if you were to look at the climate map for Maine, for four months of the summer, the dew point tends to be above 60 degrees. In the wintertime, the air is so dry that we walk around with, with problems with contacts and eyes drying out. Spring and fall, just open a window, right? And you get nice air. So, so your challenge in Maine housing is this is the miracle that keeps plants alive. In, in our climate and many other climates, that when that happens in your house, <laughs> it's not good. This is because someone said, you need a dehumidifier, but open the windows. No, <laughs> you need to close the windows in July and August and run a dehumidifier. But you need a, 
a cold temperature dehumidifier, not one that was designed to run at 85 degrees, and I'll show you one of those later. The bad news is this is like 250 bucks, and a cold temperature dehumidifier is like 1,000 bucks. Um, so there's not, not, till they've had a moisture problem in their basement and found some money to buy a $1,000 dehumidifier, most people don't own it. If you'd like to make it worse, put carpet down on your concrete floor in your basement and let it hide the moisture and then grow stuff. Yeah. So we learn what not to do. Now, Efficiency Maine will actually help you buy a heat pump water heater. The byproduct of a heat pump water heater is it actually drives the air. And one of my engineers put a heat pump water heater in his house and actually managed to turn off the dehumidifier and still have a dry basement in the winter because he had three people taking showers. So one person taking showers, I'm not sure you'd dry the air enough, but in a normally occupied house with a full-size basement, closing the windows and letting this thing dry the air meant he, he got his electric, he shut off his boiler and his electric bill was no different than running the dehumidifier, so he eliminated his oil bill and had a dry basement. Um, and what's the rebate? Anyone knows? Is it 500 bucks or more now from Efficiency Maine for putting... So if you need a new hot water heater in your house and it's electric, think about putting in a heat pump water heater. If you've got a stone basement in an old house and you can afford to do it, I don't particularly like two-part spray foam, but it's the best thing you can do to a rock basement. You cover from the sills down to about two feet off the floor with two-part spray foam with an ignition barrier over, and you go from a damp and dingy basement to a dry and warm basement. You just cut your fuel bill by a third. Uh, you can even carry it onto the floor if you put in a drainage system. I'll show you that in a crawl space in a minute. So there's some amazing technology and tools available for making old homes healthy. <laughs> this is what underneath my house looked like the first time I tried to insulate it. Um, it's not what you want to do in a crawl space. Uh, there's a couple of things wrong with it, but I'll show you how I fixed it. Um, that would be a good thing to do in a crawl space. Insulate the walls and the floor with two inches of spray foam, put a drainage system under it, and take the insulation above your head out. So now you've got a warm and dry crawl space along with a warm and dry home. Again, I don't love two-part spray foam, but for some things it's an amazing, effective material. That's your standard crawl space dehumidifier. Goes for like 900 bucks or a thousand, depending where you find it on the internet. Um, I actually believe there's a couple of folks in Maine now stocking these. Uh, that removes like 100 pints a day of water, where the little thing that sort of might work before it turns into a block of ice is like 30 pints a day. Um, so in this case, you get what you pay for. Uh, and you got to block up those windows in a basement or a crawl space in July and August. <laughs> or the area you're letting in on most days is just soaking the crawl space or basement. Um, people eventually figure that out. This is what under my house looks like now. It, it was built in 1925. They dug down to the hard pan, put in granite blocks, and then put six by sixes on top of the granite blocks. So I dug it down a foot by hand back when I was much younger. And, and there's black EPDM roofing on the earth to keep the moisture from evaporating. Uh, and above my head, there's either three or six inches of blue or pink foam screwed up to the bottom of the floor joists. And it's not the place to go in August. Why? But do I find it? This time of year, it'd be a nice time to crawl around in there, except it's dusty. What's it like in there when in, in August? Moldy. It's soaked. Because the outside air is coming in, hitting dew point on the plastic, not causing any damage to the plastic, and then dripping down onto the floor. So you crawl around in mud in August. Now that's completely isolated from the breathing air of the building. So under here it smells musty. In the building you never smell it because it's completely air sealed meticulously by your personally, um, both inside and outside. Because um, making it dry and warm was not feasible. 
It's like four feet deep on one end and six inches deep on the other end, and the, the water table's like six inches down on this end, and it was much better to isolate it than make it, try to make it warm and dry. So mold is pretty straightforward, all kinds of guidance on how do you get rid of it. It's not kill it, it's get rid of it, remove it, under containment, don't make a mess. All kinds of guidance available on, on how to do it. Um, and if you got a lot of it, you probably ought to provide a hire a, a trained professional to deal with it. They know that real well because they've learned on asbestos. Um, and the, the principles are all the same. So let, let's wrap up and talk about high performance homes. Department of Energy is now having great set success marketing net zero ready home. Build a home like this. When you can afford it, stick PV panels on the roof. It's a net zero house. Um, this is not new. Okay? It's new marketing. In simplistic terms, if you want to have a net zero ready house, you put an R60 cap on the attic or roof, you make walls that are R35 plus, and you make the earth contact ground at R20, which is four layers of foam, make it tight, you're done. This was first done by my colleague in teaching, 1982, finished in 1983 in Gorham, Maine, Dave Johnston and company. Dave has been teaching with me for, since I met him in 82. Um, this is not rocket science. There's all kinds of ways to do this, but if you're only building the minimum code, no one's doing it. There's lots of people who will sell you proprietary systems for doing it on the web or by their creation, but the, it's, it's relatively simple to do. The old code that Maine has, it's an antique, says that house shall leak less than seven air chains per hour at 50 pascals. My retrofit's down a little bit below this. The new codes say, by the way, you need to be less than half that. Otherwise, you still have too much air going through it when it's 20 below zero, and you're going to complain about your energy building doubling for the month that it's 20 below zero compared to 20 above, because air movement through a building is not linear. It's exponential difference. So when you guys start to get below zero, I burnt more wood, even though I'm only burning a cord this year, I burnt more wood in the two weeks of, that we had below zero every night than I burnt all the rest of the winter because of the driving force of that temperature difference. And there's all kinds of guidance on commercial buildings now, and part of my staff makes its living testing commercial buildings as they're built to see how much they're going to leak because most universities know they don't want, or schools don't want their building to leak when it's finished. This is my office in Harrison built in 93 with the same technology as 83. Uh, you can see in the summertime there's good shading here so we aren't getting a lot of solar gain in the summer and in the winter of the sun the guys have to actually close blinds to be able to see their computers, but we're still getting heat in that window cavity. And in five years ago, I added some PV to the roof. I have a simple mantra, as long as the code guys don't make you do otherwise, put on as much as you could possibly think about affording, because you can never have too much electricity, which is now why I bought a plug-in. Um, that's my brother's home. Same technology from 82 applied to his house. The PV's on his garage. And this is a, a hot water system that's actually a solar-assisted geothermal heating and cooling system. It's net zero, has been since he built it in 2013, he, and he loves it. Those are websites where you could find all you ever wanted to know about that house. But in simplistic terms, whatever you're going to do should have two feet of cellulose on top of it. So this is a truss system with two feet of cellulose. It's what David's house has, it's what my office has, it's what my daughter's house now has, it's what my brother's house has. Why do you bother with R60 in the attic or roof? Because it's cheap. It, it leaks the same heat out everywhere can, by conduction, so you do an R35 in a wall, because making an R60 wall is hard to do and expensive. Making an R60 attic or roof is easy to do and not that expensive. And making an R20 earth contact with four inches of home is the, foam is easy to do. Okay. Basements are fairly simple. Anytime you're going to put down foam, put down two layers, stagger the seams so you don't end up 
when it shrinks a little bit, losing your insulation value. So that's why that seam is staggered. Um, and, and if you're gonna build a wall system, it needs to have drainage, it needs to have some kind of drainage paper, it needs to have flashing above the window, flashing below the window. The one thing you don't want is a leaky attic hatch. You don't want breathing air going into your attic. Lots of folks would sell you now various devices to put, if you have one of those pull down staircases, lots of folks will sell you some kind of device to seal that. Um, and passive house tightness requirements are real stringent. You can actually buy now a pull down ladder that meets the passive house standard for building tightness and energy efficient, but it costs you a thousand bucks. But it does give you access via stairs to an upper level. Most folks would say, oh, don't even do that. Figure out how to get into it from some other place besides cutting a hole in your ceiling. But the, the fire folks would like to be able to get up there and require some kind of opening to get to in case there's a fire up there. Ventilation, pretty straightforward. This is an air-to-air -air heat exchanger, which many people are putting in new construction. That's a through-the-wall unit. Um, this is courtesy of Renew Air. I forgot to put the credit up there. And yeah, that stuff's going to add a couple of thousand bucks to the cost of new construction, but it gives you planned ventilation all the time with the right amount of air, and you don't have to wonder whether you're getting enough outside air to meet requirements. We're now switching to high-performance retrofits. <laughs> um, if you want to know how to do high-performance retrofits, literally Google the Thousand Home Challenge. I became aware of it through Linda Wigington, who started it, who Norm knows real well at this point. Linda was my inspiration for, hey, I've been building a house for 30 years. Can I actually reduce the energy use by 80%? Okay. And I now have three entrances in that. Uh, and uh, my answer back a few years ago after I met Linda was, I think I know how to do this now. After 30 years of learning this stuff, I think I know how to do this. So this is the Lake Center in Bridgeton, Maine, where we took a log cabin, a breezeway, and a garage and turned it into a lake research center. This is six inches of rigid foam being added to the existing log cabin roof. Um, this is the finished product. This roof is R40. This roof's R40. That one's R40. That one's R40. These walls are now R40. This is still logs. And this is a laboratory and training area for kids. This is a reception area. This is housing for three people. This is a conference room. So this is inside the conference room upstairs. This is a heat pump, a radon mitigation system. And it has a Renew Air energy recovery unit. That's 80% efficient. So whatever you're throwing out that you don't want in the building anymore, you get 80% of the heat back. Or in the summertime, you get 80% of the air conditioning back. That's a mini split, um, which will give you heating and cooling. And that's a condensing propane-fired boiler for heat in the basement of the log cabin building. That picture earlier was the CO2 meter in the conference room of this building used to, to tell people when to go turn on the ventilation. By the way, the first year of the building, we were like, oh, we don't need that thing. And I, I did data logging in the conference room, and it went up to like 3,000 one day. And they're like, well, I guess we do need an exhaust fan. So we retrofitted a two-speed exhaust fan into the building. This is another one of my learning experiences. I bought this in 2008 because my son needed a place to live in Utah when he was going to the University of Utah. And it was the cheapest thing I could find. It's a log cabin. It had a dirt floor basement. And water ran inside one of the basement and out the other. And I figured, hey, my son and I can rebuild this. So the next summer, he and I spent two months um, changing it so it worked better. We added four and a half inches of foam to the roof, again, with staggered seams. We excavation by Armstrong in the basement. He had a summer job. <laughs> wheelbarrow, pick, and shovel. He excavated the dirt down and went the upper end of the building. And we put in rigid foam and concrete. The only thing I do different is there's only an inch of foam here. I should have picked two inches of foam. It's nice and cool in the summertime, but it's still 
a little cool in the wintertime. I should have put more foam in it at the time. We had a disagreement on how far this was supposed to be shoveled down by the time I got there. We didn't have enough time to shovel it down another two inches. It's clay that you, you literally rent a jackhammer and jackhammer away at the clay to get it to break up. Above your head, we took out the fiberglass and we put two-part spray foam on the end of the band joist. So this is the finished basement after we renovated it. This is what it started out looking at. Okay, so it went from an unusable space with two washing machines and a dryer parked in it to what we call the TV room. By the time I was done, it still is it's below that seven because making an existing building tight that's logs is a challenge, but it, it, it's reduced the energy use by like 70% or 60%. I haven't quite met the thousand home challenge yet, but it's close. Um, part of the problem is I have a hot tub on the porch that's using electricity, and although I've buried it in eight inches of foam, it, it's still wrecking my energy budget. But The great news is it went from a building that would be 70 here, 85 in the loft, and barely manageable in the basement, to a building that's comfortable throughout, and this is now a storage area. Um, so drastic change in comfort and use by insulating the basement and the attic and air sealing the logs. This is a museum in Concord, New Hampshire. Anyone ever been there? It's a great, great building. Uh, we got involved a couple of years ago and gorgeous building, historic structure. So you got to figure out what can I do to this building to make it energy efficient without changing the looks. The one thing we agreed upon is all those skylights are now covered and insulated, and this is LED lighting. So the skylights still look like skylights, except it dropped the heat leakage from the upper area of the building by 50%, eliminating those skylights. Um, so major difference in heat leakage. We put in new boilers and an air handling system, so these are condensing gas-fired boilers. Um, dropped the energy use in half, the cost by 80%. The electric's 20% lower. So you asked about renovation. The, the only real challenge I see with renovation is someone coming up with the money to do it. The technology's there. This is a Hannaford store in Vermont. I saw an excellent presentation in Vermont last year. You can notice it actually has doors on the refrigeration section. Uh, so this isn't the frozen section, this is the refrigeration section. So instead of the cold air all falling down on your feet and you being in there going, I can't wait to get out of here, people now like hang around figuring out what they want to buy and then open the door and get it. And it's got all LED lighting making the food look attractive and you can see the quality of what you're about to buy. Um, so this is the store, Hannaford store. They, by making the energy efficiency changes, it went from the worst performing store energy-wise to the best performing store, and the sales went up, and they had a 70%, a 7 increase in customers coming into the building. So the real challenge is how do you find the money to do that? They were looking at could we justify it on sales increases alone by modernizing this store, but Efficiency Vermont gave them some money to put into it. This is work in Boston where they simply went in and changed from old boilers to gas-fired condensing boilers. So you go from a building efficiency of 50% of your fuel, the rest is going up the chimney, to less than 6 or 9% of your fuel is going up the chimney. Um, they drastically reduced their energy bills by like 30% just from changing the boilers. They put in variable frequency drives on the pumps, where if you slow a pump down by 20%, you cut the electric use by 50%. So, so that, that's all utility, I don't know what the agency is called in Massachusetts, but for Section 8 housing, they completely fund all that work because it's a gas and electric utility doing it. So let's close. This is the thing I bought in 81. Um, all the ones I've showed you, we've done full papers on and presentations at conference. This was a Thousand Home Challenge candidate in 2015, and then I started plugging away at it. 
So this is back in 81 where we were tearing out windows. Um, this is infrared thermography of after my first round of dense packing with cellulose. So we put two feet of cellulose in the attic. I built ramps down the two um, attics so I could still get to stuff if I wanted to. And we filled it with cellulose. And this wall has all been dense packed with cellulose. You can see there's actually a, a cast iron vent that goes up through here, which is why you got some heat leakage. This is a, an R35 roof. You can see it's cold. But you can see the wall roof interface is not cold. So I said, I want to make this place so I can live here another 15 years or 20 years if my body will let me do that. So let's go full bore. <laughs> we took the fiberglass walls, cut holes in them, indensed packed the fiberglass bats with cellulose to try to tighten the house up. So this wasn't just to add insulation. It was dense pack cellulose to tighten the house up. And when you dense pack a wall, you could actually take the wall down and the stuff stays there. That's how dense you put it in. Um, and this is dense packing the space between the second floor and first floor, which we never got to in the first round of, of work. Um, and so this is a fiberglass insulated wall that, again, we're dense packing with cellulose to, to tighten the building up. So that leakage went away when we did that. Um, we, did, we addressed lead paint at the same time. So the, our value of my retrofit now is R60 attic, somewhere between R35 and 40 and all the other surfaces, R30 with that foam screwed up in the basement. But now when I heat the living room to 72 degrees, it's 68 on this. There's no heat on the second floor of this building. Um, the kitchen is a little cooler if all the heat's in the living room. I fix that. And, and this, this is a valve pit to get sewer and water in and out, and it typically stays around 60 in there. So we're back to my mantra of R60 cap, R35 plus wall, R20 basement. You're done. It, it will work right if you do that. Without a mini split or a dehumidifier, that's my wife's hiking boot. So you're still stuck with July and August. You need to dry the air that's moving through your building. So I now have two mini splits. We moved the little one I put in the living room first to the north side of the chimney. So I now have a back hall that's no longer freezing cold when it's cold. And I put a bigger unit in the living room in January. And I turned it on the week of the, the, the second week of the 20 below. I can now heat my house at 20 below without firing up the wood stove or the backup boiler. So that, that's how good these low temperature heat pumps are uh, compared to what was around 10 years ago. So I've gone from 12 cords of wood back when she said, you can't heat this place, down to one cord of wood, which means I've drastically changed the amount of work I have to do <laughs> or, or my neighborhood air quality. It now meets the option B requirement in the 1,000 home challenge, which you could go there and figure out. I've reduced the energy use in that house by 80%. Um, and my folk, my kids and my wife have lived through this experiment. <laughs> so I, I thank them for that. Um, if you wanted some idea, how would I do this, you can actually go to the 1,000 home challenge websites, and there's 10 steps to reducing your energy if, your energy use and improving your health on that website, which is basically plug away at figuring out what you need. And once you've done it, verify that it's working. Um, and once you've done that, you need to figure out how to document it, especially if you're burning wood. You have to weigh the wood if you want to meet the 1,000 home challenge criteria. Um, so in summary, I only see two issues with this. Somebody's got to come up with the money to make these kind of renovations. Landlords could do it, especially if they were paying the heating bills, because then there's incentive to do it. Uh, homeowners, this, this like, no, my tax deduction for improving my energy efficiency was sort of a joke for a while. It doesn't, does it exist now? Anyone know? I think it ran out in 2016. I don't know. But, but let's, just, let's assume you need somewhere between 10 and 50 grand to cut the energy use in a house by 80%. You really want to do that, figure out a way to come up with the money through the tax system. You know? 
do you really want to give the 1% another tax break if you could be changing how much energy we use? Um, that's not my decision, but it's certainly a decision that could be made. You could give landlords all kinds of incentives for reducing energy use in, in rental property. Um, you probably still need to think about resilience, people being prepared for climate change, whether it's putting a hand pump on their drilled well, which actually exists as a company. I think they're in Maine, but you can Google that company. They make a hand pump to go on your drilled well, so you can get water if you don't have electricity. Um, and you need to think about planning for how am I going to take care of my family if we don't have power for 10 days. I've lived without power three times for 10 days. To make a long story short, if you think you've exhausted all possibilities, rethink it. So, so here's the deal. Oh, by the way, MIAQC has a great conference coming up in May on energy. This is my next endeavor, which you guys asked me to mention something about. The deal I made with my wife is I'm going on a 10-week bike trip this summer from Portland, Oregon to Portland, Maine, raising funds for the Fuller Center uh, for housing, which are the folks who started Habitat. And the deal I made with my wife is twofold. You're going to be gone for 10 weeks. I want backup power. So I went about buying a propane fire generator, and it's all set up, and it actually worked last month. When the power went out at 10 o'clock at night, it kicked on, and my wife's there. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> So I've, I've kept that part of the bargain. The rest of the bargain I have with her is after I've gone for 10 weeks riding a bike with a group of great people, uh, we get to go camping for a couple of months. Um, so she gets her time and, and I get mine. So that's my last slide. Thank you. I went a little over. Sorry. Um, Very good.